This Sunday, we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. It's a big day all over the world. But what does Resurrection Sunday actually mean? What is the gospel of Jesus Christ and how important is the resurrection to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Can you believe the gospel without the resurrection? What happens if you deny the resurrection? Does it mean we lose our salvation? Does it mean that we never really believed? To deny the resurrection has dire consequences. Errors after error after error. It would have a domino effect in our life. It would affect how we view Jesus Christ. It would affect our relationship with God the Father. It would, it would affect our hope in the kingdom to come. Join me today as we hear from Paul the Apostle what the gospel is and how important the resurrection is to the gospel and to all who believe. Thank you for joining me today for this Sunday School lesson. My name is Reverend Dr. John W. Wilson III. Hello, YouTube family. Hello, Facebook family. This is Reverend Dr. John W. Wilson bringing you the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, April the 12th, Resurrection Sunday, 2020. Before we get started in our lesson, I just want to remind you if this lesson is a blessing to you, or if you think it can be a blessing to someone else, please hit the like button, the share button. And if you're on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. I would greatly appreciate it. I would like for this lesson and future lessons to get out to as many people as possible. So let's get into our lesson. Our lesson today uh, comes from uh, it comes from 1 Corinthians 15 chapter, verses 1 through 8, then 12 through 14, then 20 through 23. And the title of the lesson is A Resurrected Savior. That's key. That's important. That summarizes this whole lesson for today. So let's get into our lesson. Let's talk about what's happening. As you know, 1 Corinthians is written by Paul the Apostle. And so uh, he started the church in Corinth. And in this setting here, he is uh, receiving letters about things that are going on. He's trying to address them. But he's a founding uh, apostle of the church at Corinth. The church at Corinth is a multi-talented church. They are gifted in so many areas, in speech, uh, in music, in articulation. Uh, they are a, a wealthy church. Uh, Paul is uh, later on has called them to give to the church in Jerusalem. And he specs a lot out of them because they have a lot to give. And so this is a church that uh, God has blessed tremendously. The problem with this church is a little bit is that they are Hellenistic. Or they come from a Greek background, a Roman background. In other words, they bring that type of baggage, uh, secularism or heathenism, into the church. That's their baggage that they're bringing. And sometimes when you have baggage, it's very difficult to let go. And so their baggage is dealing with philosophy, uh, intellectualism, materialism, things of that nature, mythology, and they bring that baggage into the church. And so part of Paul's uh, thinking or doing is to undo that type of thinking and sometimes that type of thinking is very difficult to shake. And that's a little bit of what the problem is here. Uh, Paul has taught them well, but after he's gone away for a while, those old thoughts and belief systems kind of creep back into their theology, into what they believe. They're still saved, but they're struggling with that there. So that's what we, we have here. As we come to chapter 15, uh, in 14, he talks about orderly worship. He talks about 
that hymns and songs and speech are designed to build people up. Uh, he talks about uh, when to prophesy, having an interpreter. He talks about women in church. And he talks about orderly worship, how everything should be done in decent and order. So he lays out the ground rules for the church because remember this Corinthian church, the Hellenistic background, that Greek background, uh, it brings a little chaos into the church and he's just trying to set things straight. So when we get to chapter 15, he's probably addressing some things that were either written to him or was heard because he wants them to fully understand the resurrection. He's taught them the resurrection before, but somehow it did not hold and he's going to have to revisit it with them. And it's, it's like us. Sometimes we learn things and we learn it well and we understand it when we learn it. But if some time passes by, months, maybe years, we may forget kind of what we learn. We forget the meaning behind it or we don't study like we should and stay on top of it. And then we kind of creep back to what we kind of believe before without even thinking about it. So he's going to address the issue of the resurrected Christ on why that's important because they are slipping in that issue. Uh, intellectualism, culture beliefs, uh, philosophies are clouding their thoughts and Paul needs to set it straight. So that's where we're at right now. So let's look at chapter 15. Paul says now, as he's talked about orderly worship, he says, I would remind you, brother, this is a reminder and I believe it's a strong reminder because the resurrection is that important that it's not a casual subject, something that is vital to the gospel that we'll find out here. So I believe he's strongly reminding them, not so much scolding them, but almost to the point of scolding them, I'm reminding you, brother, of the gospel I preach to you. Paul says, when I found this church, I laid out the gospel for you. I told you what it is and the importance of it. He says, uh, we, and you received it. He said, which you received, you uh, understood it, you accepted it, you became saved, it became part of your lives. And right now in which you stand, you are standing on that gospel message right now. You are, 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 are standing firm to that gospel message and by which you are being saved. That gospel message that, I, that you received, that was presented to you, that was preached by me, is saving you right now. So he's, he's reminding them how important this gospel is to their life and how important every aspect of it is. He says, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, he says, that's what I want you to do. I want you to hold fast to it. He says, but if you don't hold fast to it, then what you say you believe, like in Jesus Christ, is in vain. If you don't hold to this gospel, to the whole gospel, then what you say you believe is all for nothing. It has no purpose. It has no meaning. And it has no backbone. So what Paul is saying here, if you get the gospel wrong, if you mess up with the gospel, then what you believe is all in vain. It has no value. Now he's not telling them that they're losing their salvation because he just tells up front that they received it. But he's telling them that this is what we believe and this is what you must believe. And for anybody to believe something else is all in vain, has no purpose, has no power. Verse three says, for I delivered to you as of first importance, what I also received. I told you what I received. I gave to you what was given to me. I gave to you what was really important first because what was given to me was of first important also. So I gave you the most important thing first and which was the gospel. This is what he says, that Christ died for our sins. That's the first thing he told him. Christ came, died for our sins. That's important because we couldn't die for our own sins. As you know, sin separated us from God. 
We were unworthy. We are unworthy before God. We are unworthy sacrifices to die on our own. So Christ had to come and die on the cross for our sins as the perfect sacrifice. So the gospel is first, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, as according to what the scriptures prophesied. Then it says that he was buried. Not only did Christ die, but he was placed, buried in a tomb, laid in a tomb because he was actually dead. You don't bury live people in a tomb. You don't put people who are alive in a grave. You put dead people in a tomb. So Christ died on the cross. He was really dead. He was dead. He was, what was done to him, what was done to dead people all around, put into a tomb, buried. And then the other part, he says, that he was raised on the third day in accordance to scriptures. The gospel is Christ died, he was buried, and rose on the third day as the scriptures predicted. See, this raise is not an ordinary raise. It is a resurrection. Uh, in the Bible, you had many people who died and were raised by prophets or by Jesus himself. You had a little girl, Jairus' daughter, who was uh, raised by, died and, and raised back to life by Jesus Christ. But she lived, but she eventually died. You had the widow's son raised by a prophet, Elijah. But he was raised from the dead, but he eventually died. You had uh, Peter's mother-in-law that Peter raised from the dead, but she eventually died. But the key here is resurrection power. When it says raised on the third day, that speaks of resurrection. You are resurrected, you are raised from the dead, never to die again. You are raised from the dead with a glorified body. You are raised again with a body that does not die, does not get sick, does not get ill. You are raised uh, with a glorified body. And that's what Jesus was raised with according to the scriptures. So when somebody says what's the gospel is, the gospel is that Jesus died for us our sins. He was buried, literally, and on the third day, according to the scriptures, was resurrected. And that resurrection, as we're going to find out in this lesson, has enormous, uh, enormous theological meanings with it, enormous benefits to us because Jesus Christ was resurrected. And we have him as our Lord and Savior. So here, and now, look what else he says here. It's key. What he's, Paul is laying out the case is, you must believe this resurrection. You have no reason to doubt the resurrection. You see, the problem in this culture here, the Hellenistic culture, which I told you about, is they, uh, they had trouble believing the resurrection because the resurrection to them was that uh, this body that we have was going to be the body that we would have in glory. And that's where they made the mistake. They, they believe that the soul separates itself from the body at death, goes to heaven to a higher realm, but the body forever stays in the ground because who would want an old wore out body living forever in glory. It would be like a snake shedding its skin. The skin is the body, and the shake is shedding that skin at death, never to return to that skin again. And the mistake they were making was they thought that the resurrected body would be the body that you and I have today, this worn out, tired, old, out of shape body. That would be the body that we have not understanding that the body that God has for us is a glorified body that looks nothing like the body we have now. 
pure, holy, immortal, free of disease, free of everything, glorified, no, not dependent upon food or water at all, a glorified body in the same manner as Jesus' body is glorified. Never to die, never to get old, never to tire, never to wear out. They missed that part. And that's why they struggled with the resurrection. They felt the body was weak, something that had to be discarded. They put the emphasis on the spirit. So when they thought of resurrection, it was a spirit being resurrected and the body was left behind. But look what he says here as further proof the gospel. He says, and part of the gospel is, and that he appeared, Jesus appeared to uh, Cephas. Now only that Jesus was raised, was, I mean, excuse me, was uh, died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and was raised on the third day. But between his resurrection and his ascension into heaven, he appeared to people. He appeared to Cephas, Peter, and then to the 12. He appeared to Peter first, probably because Peter doubted him, but also because Peter was looked upon as the leader of the 12 disciples. He was the leader. And then after he appeared to Peter, during that same 40 days, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of which are still alive, meaning that Paul is telling the Corinthians, if you want witnesses that Jesus Christ was resurrected, that he did not stay in the ground, did not stay in the tomb, then all you have to do is find these witnesses and they will testify to the fact that they saw Jesus. Not only Peter will, but more, more than 500 brothers, most of which are still alive. Then he said, after Jesus appeared to Peter and then the 500, he appeared to James to all, and to all the apostles. This is James, the half-brother of Jesus. It says James and to all the apostles. See, James was the archbishop of the Jerusalem church. He was, and he was the chief apostle. When you had a discrepancy about theology, about Bible, about doctrine, you went to the Jerusalem church where James was the archbishop who sat on the council or headed the council that decided what was what the Bible said. So he's pulling out people that are credible plus the 500 witnesses. And then he says, last of all, as the one who was untimely born, meaning that he wasn't born in the same uh, era maybe as the disciples were. He was born uh, unsaved. In other words, untimely born meant that he came to know Christ at a later date. He appeared to me also. And Paul was the last person that Jesus Christ appeared to. He says, he appeared to me on Damascus Road. No, I did not have the same experience as the apostles did, but he came to me in a vision, and I, in that vision, I saw Jesus, which validates me as the apostle, which validates me as an eyewitness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what he's laying out is an argument that you must believe because these are facts that Jesus died. We all know that that Jesus was buried, that's easy to believe because most people, everybody dies and everybody's buried. But what makes the gospel so significant and unique and different from any other religion or faith here on earth is the resurrection. That's why we celebrate resurrection. That celebrates, uh, that separates the uh, believers or Christianity from Islam from uh, any other philosophy, from the Jewish faith, uh, from the Krishna beliefs, because of the resurrection. Anybody could die 
anybody could be buried, but nobody's right being raised on the third day 